Well, good evening. I can tell that this is a crowd that at least in includes at least a few people who know me because you know that if you don't quiet down, I'll start singing and it'll really spoil things. And we've got such a great speaker, I don't want to scare you all out of the auditorium. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm John Racanelli, the CEO of the National Aquarium. <clears throat> it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our fourth and final talk of this year's speaker series for the Marjorie Lynn Bank Lecture Series, which has been focused on creative conservation, sharing new perspectives on nature. So we've had everybody from authors, photographers, and, uh, and, and field conservationists. Um, Teresa Pierno from National Parks Conservation Association came and helped us celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the park system. Uh, Jill Johns, author of Urban Foods, who I think is here tonight. You here, Jill? Yeah, oh, right there. Uh, Phil Renaud from the Living Oceans Foundation, very interesting organization that's doing globally uh, valuable uh, marine research. And then most recently, Jeff Maritzian from National Geographic. We've had a wonderful series and we saved the best for last. <clears throat> and that's our speaker tonight. In all cases, what we've tried to do is focus on how the diversity of life on our blue planet, uh, how words, photos, and films and others can shape the way we view these things. And I think that Mark is going to provide us with some really interesting insights into that. We've now been able to host Marjorie Lynn Bank lectures for 15 years, uh, thanks to the generosity of the Bank family. I think many of you know who Marjorie was. She was a photojournalist, an environmentalist, a diver, and an explorer who was taken all too soon from this world back in the 90s, um, but who, whose family uh, with a very great foresight, endowed this speaking series in her name. Uh, it's been wonderful for us to be able to play a part in sharing her love of the ocean. <clears throat> Most recently, recently we had, can you bring this up, Manny? Recently we had, <laughs> we had a National Geographic photographer here named Bob Talbot who told us that one of his favorite photographers when he used to read Skin Diver magazine was Marjorie. So it's really wonderful to see how she's affected the lives of many people. Um, I'd like to thank the banks again for their wonderful generosity that makes this happen. And with that, I'd also like to thank our members and donors, many of you tonight, who make it possible for us to connect people with the aquatic world through our exhibits, our education programs, our conservation initiatives, and many more. So with that, I thank you again and if you're not a donor or a member, please become one. <laughs> Mark's going to say that too, I think. So, um, You know, many of you who are familiar with the National Aquarium know that our mission is to <clears throat> inspire conservation of the world's aquatic treasures. What is less known to people is our vision, the destination that we endeavor to reach. And that is to change the way humanity cares for our ocean planet. Why? Well, because we need to do a better job of caring for our ocean planet. It's, it keeps us alive, it provides us our oxygen, it takes up a lot of our carbon, it feeds two billion of us as our primary source of protein and another two billion as a secondary source of protein. And when it can, it moderates our weather and it makes it possible for us to exist in this tiny little envelope called the atmosphere on Earth. We think we can do that. We think we can do that by helping create a generation of what we call hope-filled conservationists. Uh, I've dedicated my life to that quest, and I know that a lot of our colleagues at great institutions like the Nature Conservancy have done so as well. Um, and that, with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker. First of all, great Baltimore connections that Mark Tursek has with us. He served, he was on the board of the Rouse Company, I just found out tonight, which most of you know was the uh, origin of our inner harbor, Jim Rouse, and that very visionary man and company that served uh, Baltimore's interest so well with, with our legendary mayor, Donald Schaefer. He is also, to this day, a member of, uh, and a board member of the uh, Mutual Fund Board of T. Rowe Price and continues to maintain that relationship with our, with our esteemed Baltimore company. I know we have a few of our friends from T. Rowe here, and even though he told me not to say it, Ted Weiss, who's on our board, is also here with us tonight. I'm glad you're here, Ted. As CEO of the Nature Conservancy, he really has been, he's really led the organization these last eight years in growing its, um, its capacity to bring together organizations and individuals to get things done, benefit people, and especially benefit the planet. He's the author of the best-selling book, Nature's Fortune, How Business and Society Thrive by Investing in Nature, and 
following the lecture, he'll be signing copies of it in our gift shop, and I hope you'll go over there and get a signed copy from him. I'm going to. <clears throat> and, and he is a real champion of, of uh, nature capital, which I'm going to let him talk about with you, but really important because it, it recognizes the value of nature on its merits, but also for the ecosystem services that nature provides us, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, in his talk tonight, entitled The Power of Nature, The Path to a Sustainable Future, Mark's going to pose the question, can we really have it all? And that is a good question. Can we have a future where people can get the food, energy, and economic growth they need without sacrificing nature? I'm not going to give too much away, but Mark believes the answer is yes. And I think he's got a pretty compelling case for why. We do have to rely on science to address the challenges we face on a global scale and to really stay on, get on to, and then hopefully stay on a path to sustainability. A little background about Mark, if you don't already know, prior to joining the Nature Conservancy in 2008, he spent 24 years with Goldman Sachs. He was partner and managing director, launched the firm's environmental markets group, and then inspired by opportunity to help businesses, governments, and environmental organizations work together in new and innovative ways, Mark left Goldman Sachs to join Nature Conservancy. Uh, earlier this year, he was appointed by President Obama to the President's Advisory Committee for Trade Policies and Negotiations. He served on the New York State 2100 Commission, which was created in the wake of Superstorm Sandy to look at ways to make infrastructure more resilient to storms. Um, he's a member of several boards, really pretty impressive ones, Resources for the Future, the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, Harvard Business School, his alma mater's Social Enterprise Initiative, uh, Science for Nature and People Partnership, and NatureVest. O.N. Williams College, where he did his undergrad work, so he is quite a character, interesting man, has a really great story to tell us, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming Mark Tersek. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. It's always inspiring to be in a place like the National Aquarium. It's great to be surrounded people, by people like you, people who care about nature. I bet many of you are supporters of the aquarium, the Nature Conservancy, or other good environmental organizations. Thank you very much. Your support makes a big difference. You all have a lot to be proud of. Thanks to you, the environmental movement is getting a lot done, and we're grateful for everything you do to make that possible. However, when we look ahead, especially these days, the future for nature can seem daunting. But I have some good news to share. The Nature Conservancy, or TNC for short, we're a science-based enterprise. And we have a detailed, no-nonsense, science-driven plan for how to build a sustainable future. That's what I want to talk about tonight. I recently asked our scientists, and John mentioned this, to take a hard look at whether we really can have it all. A world where people get the food, energy, and economic growth they need without sacrificing nature. And we believe the answer is yes, if, if we do things right. Now, in both scenarios, we looked at two paths, business as usual and sustainability. In both scenarios, we made the same assumptions. By 2050, we anticipate human population will grow about 40% to around 10 billion people. The global economy will grow 3% plus per year. Demand for food will grow by 70% faster than population growth because billions of people will be lifted out of poverty and as they do so they'll want more protein-based diets. And energy demand will grow by about 70 percent. So note, we're not making any heroic assumptions here. We're being very realistic. So let's take a look at the impacts for people and nature on each path. What happens in business as usual? Well, it's ugly and there's a lot of suffering. Global temperatures rise by more than 3 degrees Celsius. Some 5 billion people face significant health challenges from air pollution. Only 40% of global fisheries are sustainable. The rest collapse. And only a very small percentage of land, 1.4%, is protected for nature. Let's look at the sustainability path. Here things are much better. Global temperatures rise by only 1.5 degrees Celsius. Less than 1 billion people face major health impacts from air pollution. Still too many, but of course much better. All of the world's fisheries are sustainable, 
and 17% of land is protected for nature, a big win for biodiversity. The second path is what I want to talk about tonight. Now, to be sure, taking this path uh, isn't going to be easy. But our compass points us in a clear direction, and our conviction is equally strong. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, is this guy a dreamer? Did he miss the election? <laughs> no, I didn't. I know this is a sensitive time in politics and policy, especially here in the US and especially in our field. So let me talk about this for a minute. President-elect Trump said some things during the campaign that environmentalists like me find very alarming. And of course, there's also growing concern about a number of his pending political appointments. There is indeed a lot to worry about. But there's also a lot of opportunity ahead. The biggest thing I've learned in my nine years in this job is this. When we draw on science, pragmatism, and conviction, we can win. When we focus on protecting and investing in nature, we truly can rise above divisiveness. We're able to find common ground and inspire diverse groups of people to come together to solve big challenges. Why is that? Well, everyone depends on nature. Really, nobody is against nature. Just about everybody enjoys nature. I believe everyone can learn to appreciate why it's in their best interest to support smart environmental policy. Accordingly today, when much of our work seems to be under attack, traditional environmentalists, including me, will need to be more open-minded. We'll need to better understand the range of ways our fellow citizens appreciate nature. We'll have to see that different people have different ideas on the best ways to protect nature. For instance, some people will be in favor of renewable energy as a source of new jobs and economic growth. Others, say hunters or fishers, value nature as a place for recreation and sport. Military leaders will want to address the security risks that arise from climate change, things like droughts, food shortages, and refugee crises. People living on coasts will focus on sea level rise and extreme weather. Midwestern farmers will be concerned about droughts and depleted soil. Inner city residents may be more concerned about local pollution, health issues, and environmental justice issues. And traditional conservationists will continue to value protecting biodiversity and beautiful places. At TNC, we've always tried to accommodate or build on such diverse interests and motives. We focus on programs that appeal to a broad range of people with diverse motivations. And that's exactly what we intend to do over the years ahead. So back to our two paths. How do we get on this road to sustainability? There's lots we need to do, of course. But our science tells us we need to focus especially on addressing three big areas, climate change, food, and cities. Our science also tells us that nature can make a huge difference in each of these areas. In other words, it's nature to the rescue. I'll talk about each of these three challenges in a minute, but let me share a little bit about TNC so you know where I'm coming from. First, let me say there are many great environmental nonprofit organizations. I know them, I respect them, and TNC partners with almost all of them. We're each a little bit different, so I'll tell you a little bit about TNC. We got our start 65 years ago uh, when a small group of determined scientists joined together to protect the Mianus River Gorge in New York. Some of you may know the Mianus Gorge. These scientists, and here they are, they wanted to protect an important forest, and they wanted to do it in a way that would really endure. They considered every alternative they could think of, and in the end, they decided the best way to do it was to simply buy the land. So the scientists mortgaged their homes, they cashed their life insurance policies, and they bought the land. And in that very direct way, they protected the forest forever. And voila, TNC was born. Ever since, our formula for success has been established. Science-based, pragmatic, passionate. From there, we branched out to all 50 states and to 70 countries. We became leaders in marine, freshwater, urban conservation, and climate change. We grew to become a professional team of more than 4,000 colleagues, including about 500 scientists. We also have volunteer trustees in every state and country where we work, and more than 1 million members. We took that Mianus River Gorge model to scale, 
and thanks to many generous donors, great partners in civil society, and people from all walks of life, we've been able to protect extraordinary amounts of nature all over the world. But along the way, we realized we couldn't just buy our way to success. We learned that to stay ahead of the curve, we had to keep innovating and changing. Right now, for example, we're taking on new challenges like climate change, urbanization, and renewable energy infrastructure. We found we've had to stretch our organization again and again. Most recently, we've added to our mission the need to save people as well as nature. We're using new tools, economics and social science, impact investing, influencing and guiding biz big business. But through all that growth and change, our most important tool remains the same. Bring diverse groups of people together to find the common ground to tackle big challenges. And it's that skill that gives me confidence today. So let's now get back to those three big challenges I mentioned earlier, climate, food, and cities. I'll start with climate. This isn't always an easy topic. And taking on the climate challenge hasn't really been easy for TNC either. In the US, TNC is organized just like our Congress. We have chapters in each of the 50 states. And our, col our colleagues and our volunteers span all of the political spectrums. Some of them, therefore, face stiff political headwinds in their home states on the climate change issue. But at the same time, they see the places they love changing right before their eyes, changing because of higher temperatures, warmer lakes and streams, rising sea levels, and disintegrating food webs. The reality is that climate change threatens all of our work going forward. It also threatens to undo much of what, what TNC has accomplished over 65 years. So what are we doing about it? Well, we're putting our diverse team to work on science-based, pragmatic, common, common sense and common ground solutions to the climate challenge. In the US, for example, all 50 of our state chapters have a clear strategy to pursue climate action in their state in a way that will work in their state. Let me give you two quick examples. In Florida, we worked with Republican leaders to support a ballot measure incentivizing private solar installations. Just recently, voters overwhelmingly passed this measure, a big victory in the Sunshine State, which had been lagging other states in the use of solar. And in Ohio, my old home state, we're engaging with lawmakers to inform the current de debate over Ohio's renewable energy portfolio standard. We recently published a study with the Environmental Defense Fund that makes the economic case for increasing renewable energy in Ohio. We demonstrate that better standards will create thousands of new jobs and billions of dollars of economic benefit. We've still got a long way to go, but examples like this, and I have many, many more, show that it's possible to bring, bring people together from red states and blue states, urban and rural, young and old, to find common ground solutions to the climate challenge. Now, both of my examples focused on the opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through being smarter about energy. And this is enormously important, and TNC is making it a high priority. But at the same time, we've identified another critical climate solution, investing in nature. This is less well understood than the energy opportunity, so I'd like to tell you a little bit more about it. We've determined that we can achieve more than one-third of the global emission reductions needed uh, by investing in nature. That's a huge opportunity. This means protecting forests, restoring degraded farmlands, changing the way working lands are managed. These strategies not only offset carbon emissions, they also improve water security, bolster biodiversity, and support livelihoods. This is the kind of opportunity that everyone can get behind. Let me give you an example. About a decade ago, increased soybean production was destroying the Amazon rainforest. <clears throat> The Amazon not only plays a huge role in stabilizing the climate, it's also obviously important habitat for biodiversity and the home for many people. Fortunately, a diverse group of players came together to reverse deforestation in the Amazon. This is a tremendous success story. The story starts with Greenpeace. Greenpeace pushed McDonald's to stop buying soy linked to deforestation. McDonald's then went to its supplier Cargill and told the company how to, to figure out how to ensure its soy was sustainably sourced. Cargill called TNC for help. We, in turn, set up a program to help the government monitor compliance with Brazil's deforestation law, 
which had been mostly unenforced and ignored. We also trained farmers on better practices. TNC and Cargill together then got the other big international soy traders in the game. What we were able to do, and this is what we always try to do, is build a broad coalition. We brought together big and small farmers, municipal, regional, and federal governments, numerous local and international environmental NGOs, activists, scientists, and big global companies. The result, the soy moratorium, a sweeping agreement that reduced deforestation in the Amazon by 80%, 80 percent, eight zero percent. That reduction means that global greenhouse gas emissions are two to three percent lower today than they would otherwise be. An encouraging story, right? So why haven't we done this in every rainforest all around the world? Well, that's our job ahead. We must collaborate better and at bigger scale and more frequently with businesses, community groups, nonprofits, academics, activists, investors, donors, you name it. We need to find ways to finance and scale up this work. We'll also need to work with governments to change rules and create incentives to drive this change. At TNC, we are focused like a laser and making this happen as fast and as big as possible. Now, although this is a climate success story, it's also linked to another of the three areas I said I would talk about, food. As the global population grows and more people rise up and enter the middle class, the world will need to produce 70% more food by 2050. I already showed you that data. And we'll need to do it with less water, less fertilizer, and without expanding agriculture's footprint. We've also got to do it in a climate smart way. So very complicated, but doable. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Tim Smith. I first met Tim a, a few months ago when I visited his farm in Iowa. Tim's father and grandfather were farmers. Tim hopes his kids and grandkids will be too. Tim views himself as a good citizen and as a good steward of the land. He cares deeply about nature. Indeed, his livelihood depends on it. Tim got to know the local TNC team and learned there were new farming techniques that could make a big and positive difference. Practices like no-till or reduced till farming. Practices like using cover crops to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, er and erosion and nutrient runoff. So Tim said he'd give it a try. At first, Tim was teased by his farming neighbors for taking this new approach. But now, one by one, they're following Tim's lead. Today, nearly one in four farmers in Iowa are experimenting with cover crops. And nearly half of Iowa farmers are using no-till farming. They're discovering that healthy, healthier soils produce higher agricultural yields for them. They sequester carbon. They hold water more effectively. They save farmers money on irrigation, and they prevent fertilizer runoff. So it's in farmers' best interest and everyone's best interest for these practices to spread. Now, unfortunately, time's not on our side. Most soils have lost up to 70% of their organic carbon. Bad for farmers, bad for the environment. So we have to act with urgency to take these type of farming practices to scale across the U.S. and around the world. In fact, my colleagues here in Maryland are doing great work with farmers and the agricultural industry here on the Eastern Shore. We're working together to restore natural buffers along fields to prevent nutrient runoff from entering the Chesapeake Bay. We're also returning oysters to key tributaries so they can filter nutrients from the water. Transforming agriculture like this will be critical. It's also going to be critical, as we think about feeding our growing population, uh, to do so without devastating another uh, food stock, fish sources. Now, um, we're doing a lot of work in this area, too, but my team told me my speech couldn't be too long, so I'm not going to talk about that tonight. But another hugely important area, and I'm sure you're learning about that at the aquarium. And it's the same sort of drill. Show fishing countries, fishers themselves, and fishing consumers and communities how it's in their best interest to do things right. So we talked about climate and food. Now let me turn to the third piece of the puzzle, cities. By 2050, and I mentioned this, 75% of the globe's approximately 10 billion people will live in cities, three quarters of the world people. Cities could become profoundly unlivable places at the mercy of floods, storms, droughts, and terribly polluted air. But we can do much better than that. Cities can be designed to maximize sustainability. And we can use the power of nature to help cities cost-effectively manage the big challenges they face. Let me give you four examples of nature-based solutions that can make a very big difference in cities. First, 
We can plant trees to reduce urban heat, air pollution, and carbon emissions. Second, we can restore and protect coastal ecosystems to combat flood, sea level rise, and storm surges. Third, we can create green infrastructure to deal with stormwater runoff. And four, we can protect upstream watersheds to safeguard water supplies. Let me give you a the specific example of Quito, Ecuador. Here's a picture of Quito and its upstream watershed in the mountains behind the city. Instead of building an expensive new water treatment plant, we persuaded the city to instead invest in nature. The city paid to change ranching and farming practices upstream. We planted trees, reduced sedimentation into rivers, and determined where investing in nature could have the biggest impact. The city saved money. Investing in green infrastructure, that is nature, costs less and outperforms traditional man-made equipment. And conservation was achieved at the same time at no extra cost. Now we've launched 20 projects like this across Latin America, Africa, and China, and we have 40 more in the works. Looking forward, we're determined to inspire a radical rethinking of the relationship between cities and nature. We're starting by reinventing the cities of today, and then we're planning to help design the cities of the future in places like China and India and Africa. So there you have it. The three big challenges we need to tackle to create a world in which both people and nature thrive. You might be wondering, if it's all so straightforward, then why haven't we already made more progress? Well, to put it simply, we need more people to step up, get engaged, and follow their moral compass. Now, people often say to me, Mark, I see there's a lot you can do to engage on important environmental issues. You run a big environmental organization. But what can I do, they say. I'm not a professional environmentalist. I'm not a CEO or a policymaker or a big time philanthropist. Well, I have some more good news for you. There's lots you can do. First, you can engage as a citizen, especially important right now. There's an urgent need for much stronger public policy on climate change and other important environmental matters. This might seem like a heavy lift, but speaking up makes a bigger difference than you might realize. Take the great progress we've seen on marriage equality. Pro more progress than seemed even possible a few years ago. People who cared and engaged on this important matter made a very big difference. Elected officials really do listen to their constituents. So get out there, write a letter, pick up the phone, or better yet, go visit your government leaders in their offices and let them, let them know what you think. One of the most impactful things TNC does every year is something we call Capitol Hill Day. Hundreds of our trustees from every state chapter descend on, including the Maryland program, descend on Capitol Hill and meet with members of Congress from all 50 states and from all parties, and we just bang away urging them to take action on important environmental matters. Please join us. Okay, that's number one. Second, you can push your organization, whatever it is, company, school, religious institution, aquarium, you name it, to engage and lead on environmental issues. For example, in all my years in this role, I haven't come across a single organization that didn't have a chance to do things, important things, that leads to outcomes that are both good for the environment and for the organization itself. You can help make that happen. Third, you can get involved with environmental nonprofits. Now, I'm not here today to pitch TNC, but we are one worthy organization, and there are many others. I know them all, I respect them all, and they're all doing great work. But all of us, including TNC, are under-resourced. You can make a big difference, and not just by writing checks. Yes, we need financial support, but we also need engagement at all levels and in a variety of ways. You could join a board, volunteer for a project, organize a fundraiser. For example, the volunteers and trustees who support TNC's Maryland, D.C. chapter, some of whom are here today, thanks for being here, they're making just such a difference. One of their focuses, I mentioned, is improving water quality for the Chesapeake Bay and, but, and protecting coastal communities from the impact of climate change, too. And so we're partnering with the aquarium, and already we've gotten more than 1,000 middle schoolers to plant some 25,000 Atlantic white cedar seedlings along Maryland's eastern shore. That's a big deal. 
This will restore na native habitat and filter water before it reaches the bay. Okay, finally, when we think about what we can all do, let's look to the future. We need to be concerned that today's youth are spending much more of their time indoors and in urban environments, disconnected from nature. And that trend is only likely to grow. We can do something about it. Many of us are parents, grandparents, aunts or uncles. We can take our kids outdoors. We can take them to the aquarium. We can talk to them about nature and environmental issues and politics. All of us can help develop a love and respect for nature in the next generation. Let's do that. Let's do that in order to cultivate our future conservation champions. Now let me end where I began. There are two paths in front of us. One leads to a disastrous future for people in nature. The other leads to a thriving, greener planet. Which path will we take? The choice really is ours. I know the road to sustainability won't be easy. We'll need to scale up our work like never before, and we need a lot of help. We've got a plan, though, and we have reason to think it's achievable. With smart science, collaboration, and the engagement of people like you, the path to a sustainable planet is clear, and it's within reach. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start right off here, Mark. I've got, a, I've got one that we got from a, a, a one of our, our team. Uh, and this is actually very apropos to one of your recommendations about trees. Your organization, TNC, has recently issued a major report called Planting Healthy Air on using urban forests to address particulate matter and extreme heat. What does TNC see as its role in promoting this kind of solution? Yeah, thanks for asking about that. So I'm really excited about this. Um, our urban program is a new one. It's off to a great start, and I think it's really a reason for encouragement and hope, even in these tricky political times. Because um, it turns out, there have been great environmental organizations, especially environmental justice organizations focused on cities for a long time. God bless these great people. And other folks focused on parks. But traditional conservationists historically didn't have much to do with cities. But as soon as we began to explore urban opportunities, uh, urban residents are smart, practical people, and when they came to understand what nature can do for residents in cities, they're very enthused. So trees is kind of a no-brainer. Obviously, trees beautify a city, but they also reduce pollution, and they also, um, and they also address climate, and they can help with storm water runoff, and it's very affordable. It's like win, 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 win. And so we want to spread the word. You know, there's a little bit of science. Different trees work better in different places, so obviously we want to get it right, but we just want to have that scale as fast as possible. And that's why, um, again, we are all environmentalists are a little bit nervous right now because of what's happening in DC, and we take it super seriously. But what I think um, some of these new appointments in DC are going to learn too is, you know, people aren't stupid. People get, and I tried to make this point, people understand that, that protecting nature is in our best interest. And you can, you know, you can try cutting some corners briefly, but it's going to come back to bite you. We need nature on our side. Uh, those are the pragmatic reasons for protecting nature. Of course, there are more reasons for that, too. Uh, you know, people, I'm sure, like a lot of us, my colleagues and me, we think it's also the morally right thing to do. We owe our kids that better environment. Well, and as a matter of fact, <coughs> um, we've learned that here in Baltimore City, where the first uh, Fish and Wildlife declared its first urban wildlife refuge at our Masonville Cove, uh, community, not a mile from here as the bird flies, uh, there's a great sense of incredible community pride that comes yeah. with being able to bring back some of that, that uh, those natural, natural features that, that cities themselves should be made of as well. <coughs> okay, we've got lots of good stuff here. Oh, and we have an insider's question here, although it got, ah, this is from a gentleman you know. How did, a, how, did Greenpeace, <laughs> how did Greenpeace persuade McDonald's to reduce its consumption of soy grown in Oh, yeah, thanks for asking about that. So um, I included that little story on purpose. So there's sort of an ecosystem of environmental organizations. The Nature Conservancy is obviously a more centrist organization. We're trying to bring diverse people together. 
uh, to build majority coalitions to do important things. So that's important. But there are other things that are important too. Greenpeace, very differently as an activist organization, campaigning against people or organizations doing things they view as bad. So the way this one goes, Greenpeace was staging protests in Europe where they were more sensitive. You know, did you know that Ronald McDonald was leading to the deforestation of the Amazon? They got McDonald's attention very quickly, the way Greenpeace knows how to do. And you know, nice work by Greenpeace because Greenpeace got to McDonald's, McDonald's got to Cargill, Cargill got us involved, and, and that virtuous cycle, circle got going. That kind of thing happens a lot. Well, that's, I think, one of the things I've always loved about TNC, and I've been working intermittently with TNC since the 80s myself, you guys are solution focused. You really find the way to bring the solution that can serve more interest than just one. Well, here's a great one word question. Pipelines? <laughs> yeah, oh gosh, what are, the, what are the, I mean, some of the, I mean, like, uh, all the issues in our space are kind of difficult and they sometimes can be emotional. We haven't been super engaged on pipelines, which isn't to say it's not an important place to engage. We just can't do everything. Although we're big, we, we, as I noted, we're under-resourced too. <clears throat> and our bigger interest in addressing climate change is, is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. There we're really focused. So that's changing energy policy, that's ramping up energy efficiency, and that's investing in nature to sequester carbon. And so we, again, we can't do everything. So we haven't worried as much about transportation of fossil fuels. But the people going after pipelines um, view it as a good opportunity to make progress on climate, and they're probably right. And then, of course, there are communities who are impacted by these things. But it's, it's not one of the many things going on in our space right now where we're in the driver's seat. It's, it's quite a portfolio out there. And I think, actually, TNC is pretty amazing in the, in the scope of work that you all do. I, I, I make, that makes sense to me. I should add, by the way, that um, uh, those 1,000 acres of uh, uh, native Atlantic white cedar plantings that we've done includes uh, and the middle schoolers that did it ha happened to in have included John Racanelli and his wife Susan a couple of <laughs> springs ago. And other than well the done. ticks, it was an outstanding experience. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this one um, is an interesting one here. Great question. Is the Nature Conservancy doing any work in Cuba yet? And if not, any plans for doing so? We are, um, I would say first about the Caribbean. We're doing a lot of work in the Caribbean. It's a little, the nonprofit world I still find slightly puzzling after being a business person for so long. It seems to me protecting the Caribbean is a no-brainer and so many people, including prosperous, well-to-do people on the East Coast, enjoy the Caribbean and its marine habitat. It's hugely under threat. We're one of the few NGOs there, not everybody's there. And it's actually one of the diffi more difficult areas for us to raise funding for. Uh, we have a great body of work there, but we're doing it more on a shoestring than we would like uh, and, and now that includes Cuba. We've actually been a science partner of Cuba for a long time. The Cuban government was very, both the Cuban and U.S. governments were very um, supportive of us swapping science back and forth. I've been to Cuba a few times and we're trying to think through how we can do more in Cuba. However, in the case of the Caribbean, we're a little bit resource constrained right now. And so for those of you, um, if you were inspired by my what can you do comments at the end, especially if you're people who, who care about the Caribbean or visit there, boy, it needs more help from, uh, from the folks who enjoy the Caribbean. Opportunity, folks. And you know, and, and it, it corresponds, obviously, to the work of the aquarium, too. So principally, our work in the Caribbean is marine conservation. You know, for example, uh, most people are concerned about coral reefs being impacted by bad practices on land. Um, land-based pollution, bad fishing practices, and climate change. But it turns out some corals are more resilient to climate change than others, and those land-based threats or man-based threats can be managed. And so we have coral nurseries uh, in Andros. So we're growing coral in underwater nurseries to plant in weakened coral reef areas to try to accelerate regrowth of, of healthier and, and, and more resilient corals. Yeah. Let's keep going on that line because someone asked here, um, to some extent, the conservation movement has until recently been, uh, relatively recently, been conducted in terrestrial ecosystems. What are specific lessons, either to emulate or avoid, to inform aquatic and marine conservation efforts, especially specific to incentivizing conservation, conservation behavior on a larger scale? It's a great question. It's true. Um, terrestrial conservation is, 
has been way ahead of marine conservation. I think the principal reason is until very recently, we didn't know that much about what was happening below the surface of the water, whereas we knew a lot about land. Anyway, then, you know, in the last 15 years or so, you'll know this better than me, there were technological breakthroughs that allowed us to, allowed us to better understand how we were devastating marine habitat. And as soon as, you know, the truth shall set you free, as soon as we knew that marine conservation has really accelerated, and then, Although playing catch up, marine conservation can learn from the land-based experience, and I think there's a lot to learn. So what have we learned on land? We used to do a lot of so-called protected areas where we would, <laughs> with the help of a government, an organization like TNC and with some funding, would declare a park. We would do that largely indifferent to the people who live there, largely indifferent to the economic needs of that country. And guess what? These parks became known as paper parks. They were parks in paper, but the enforcement was terrible and very little was achieved. So on land, we learned, oh, for this kind of conservation programs to work, they have to make sense for the place they're located. Local communities have to benefit from the conservation. The local economy has to benefit from, from the conservation. And it's not that hard to do. We were very good at retooling how we do things. So now when we shift to the marine area, we like likewise had bad marine protected areas, but now we're learning. Work with fishing communities. I mentioned this quickly. It's a complicated area and we have a long way to go, but in fact, it shouldn't be that hard to crack this. Imagine you're a country where fishing is a big part of your GDP. Obviously, then you'll want to fish on a sustainable basis. You won't want to kill your important business. Or if you're a fisher yourself, you'll probably imagine your kids or grandkids wanting to be a fisher. So it's not that hard for people to understand it's in their best interest to do things sustainably. That doesn't mean without good economic opportunity. It usually means some enforcement and some protected areas, creating space for spawning areas, using better equipment so you don't have uh, really wasteful bycatch, which can devastate fishing stocks. So the good news is we've learned how to do all of that. We have pilot projects which prove they work, and now we need to scale it. And that's true, by the way, for so much of our work. Our projects, if you were to audit all of our projects at TNC or other organizations like ours, I think you'd say, hey, these projects are all pretty good. But then if you looked at the big picture, you'd say, hey, if all your projects are so good, why do we have all these environmental challenges? And, and the problem is we're like winning lots of battles and losing the war. So. Uh, the name of the game in marine conservation and in all conservation is acceleration and scaling. And I think we can learn a lot from the world of business. I'm probably a little biased because I used to be a business person, but if you think about big businesses that you might admire or whose stock prices rise, they've generally been businesses, they've been organizations who know how to scale. And so we conservationists have to learn from that because what's really important is time is not on our side on any of these matters. When t I think TNC has been one of the leaders in scaling the efforts that, that, that you, we d dedicate ourselves to. Okay, this person's got a nice, uh, simple question. What is TNC's role in preserving cultural values along with nature, urban farming, implementing hydroponics and aquaponic techniques? <laughs> Let's start with the cultural values, preserving cultural values with, along with nature. Yeah, we probably have a little to learn here. I mean, we get some things quite right and probably others we get less right. So it is definitely dawning on all environmental organizations, including ours, and I sort of mentioned this. We have to, we have to diversify our own skill set. So we need social scientists, we need economists, we need anthropologists, we need experts in community relations. The stuff we've always kind of gotten right, and I think it just goes back to our origins and our pragmatic style, is we've always seemed to have known, almost intuitively, our projects are only going to work if they benefit local people. So we've always been kind of a good partner in that sense. Because we've learned, if we do a project and we're indifferent to local people, the project fails. So we're, we're pragmatic enough to, uh, not to, get to understand that. So that I think we have right. But now it's dawning on us uh, too, you know, when we're working in the Amazon, et cetera, and we're concerned with the really thorny issues, we're concerned with roads, railroads, hydro facilities, et cetera. This stuff is complicated. But then there are communities whose, whose futures are at stake too. So what we do now is partner with experts. Um, we always partner with local NGOs, including ones very sensitive to these kinds of issues. But I'd also acknowledge this is an, an area where organizations like ours will have to get much, much better. Another example of this, and even this audience is probably reflective of this a little bit, the environmental movement in America, while we have so much to be proud of, it kind of blows my mind what's been able to be accomplished through sheer philanthropy and volunteerism and people devoting their lives to this mission. Good stuff, but it's a very homogeneous group. 
And, um, and so for all kinds of reasons, we need to be much more diversified. What I've learned, so of course when I joined TNC, I was for that kind of diversification, no brainer. But what I've really learned is if you're trying to do really complicated things that haven't ever been done before and involve people, you'll make better decisions and you'll execute better if your team is more diversified and is more sensitive to this broad range of thinking. So, so there's a lot we need to do to be sensitive to that kind of issue. And I think we're on it, and um, we have lots of critics. It took me a little bit of getting used to when I joined TNC. I thought, well, we're like the good guys. Why do we have so many critics? But it's a good thing, I've learned. Our critics are our friends. The work we're doing is important. It's never easy. You can make mistakes. So we try to be as transparent as possible. And then when things go wrong, or even if it looks like they might potentially go wrong, we hear about it from critics, which is a good thing. It keeps us on our toes and lets us do our work better. Well, and, and you know, I think any person with any kind of scientific background remembers that diversity is a very powerful and a very uh, resiliency-inducing phenomenon in nature. Well, it's not a coincidence that it applies in, in human society as well. Right. The second half of that person's question was around a, this very interesting topic of urban farming, hydroponics, et cetera. Any thoughts on that or any areas where TNC is engaging in that kind of work? Um, again, we, we're, qu we're quite interested. We can't, even when you're as big as we are, this is just, the, this is just a reality in nonprofit land. I mean, it's hard for anyone, it's hard to be bigger than us. Our operating budget's now over $700 million a year. So you'd say, well, you guys are huge. You must be rich. No, we're big, but we're just, we're just as strapped as every other, every other nonprofit. Every one of those dollars is fully allocated. So we can't do everything. Right now, we're hugely focused on agriculture, traditional agriculture, because getting that right is vitally important for addressing climate change, biodiversity, uh, fresh water issues, and even marine issues, because rivers run into oceans. So there, we're super focused. And we're very focused on fisheries, uh, motivated because, again, time is not on our side, but we're actually kind of optimistic because we think what we've done on land ought to work. We're interested in aquaculture. We haven't really gotten in the business yet. It's super controversial, but we're always attracted to this controversial stuff because we say, well, look, it's going to happen, and it's true. There are bad ways of doing it and good ways of doing it. Let's engage and use our science to do it well. And then in cities, we are excited about some of these, these things for the cities of the future, but, but we haven't gotten to that yet. Stay tuned. Good news here is um, lots of exciting, a lot of the excitement in Silicon Valley and like places is now focusing on these areas and we'll really benefit from those, those innovative business leaders and, and their best help too. I see places for us to work together too. We're, we're very close to our friends at the Inter Institute for Marine and Environmental Technologies just on, the, on, the, on Pier 5. It's part of the University of Maryland and they have a brilliant expert at urban aquaculture concepts. He's, he hasn't yet been able to bring it to scale, but he's come up with all kinds of amazing breakthroughs. Uh, of course, energy from algae, but also even more importantly, getting striped bass, rockfish, to eat pellets made, protein pellets made from algae without all the intermediary prey fish that are used. Uh, that need I like that. In I'm a vegan, and I like fish becoming vegans well, along with me. And then <laughs> We'll, we'll see it's sort of interesting, because um, you, you're talking about fish. It's a very, is another controversial, everything's controversial. But you know, uh, I'll just note, um, diets, especially from wealthy countries, are a huge factor in climate change. So um, if you're concerned about climate change and wondering what more you can do, you can stop eating so much meat. You'll be healthier, happier, feel better, and you'll be making actually a really big difference. Here, here. I'll see if I can get you a couple of cases of that uh, algae protein, too. <laughs> Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, this is a good one, interesting one. How far along is TNC in its efforts towards increasing awareness of the monetized value of nature? And is this a controversial topic in the conservation community? It is controversial. Um, it sort of seems weird to me that it's so controversial, but anyway, good people, good people don't see it the same way I do. They are good people. So anyway, you can imagine, I joined the Nature Conservancy after 24 years at Goldman Sachs. So I kind of came in guns blazing thinking, hey, financial oriented approaches were the answer to everything. And I was partly right, partly wrong. Um, the approaches, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. The strategies that, flo that flowed out of that thinking have been very successful. But what I underappreciated and now better appreciate and truly believe is more important than good strategies like that is, is motivating people at the heart level 
to just step up and do the right thing. And so one demerit of talking about the economics or financial value of nature is it's a little bit off-putting or it can diminish people's emotional uh, desire to dig in and help us. So fair enough. And, and for sure, when I, you know, I've had the privilege now of getting to know a lot of the world's greatest environmental leaders ever, and these are folks who are motivated by their heart, and God bless them, and, and look what they've accomplished. So you don't want to get carried away with any of these things. On the other hand, here we are, we just had this election, and we have all these uh, citizens in America who evidently want change and are concerned about things that are different than some of the things traditional environmentalists are concerned about. So we have to think about that too. And it seems to me this is a good time to remind people all around the world, hey, nature does really important pragmatic things for you. So you know, there's all this, there's going to be all this fuss about the EPA coming, whether you like it or not, because you know, President-elect Trump has appointed a kind of controversial guy to lead the EPA. And so what we environmentalists are going to have to help people better understand is it's not true. It's, it's not fair to portray the EPA as like just a place where there's bureaucrats gumming up the economy. Maybe there's some room for improvement. Everybody can be improved a little bit. But the EPA is also making sure we don't have more incidents like Flint. So nature produces really important things that we all need. Uh, clean air to breathe, healthy water to drink, a stable climate to live in, forests that prevent floods and, and, and pre prevent sedimentation and protect our topsoil and, and prevent nutrient runoff, which c causes dead zones in the Gulf, which hurts fishers' livelihoods and, and prevents us from eating fish and reduces biodiversity. So I think this is a time where it's good to re-emphasize these pragmatic benefits of nature and so we shouldn't think that this is a luxury that at this moment in time we can just push aside. By the way, that's a little bit what my book is about, uh, Investing in Nature. Now I wrote that book a couple years ago. It still all holds water, but I've learned a few things since then too. And what I've learned is you don't want to get carried away with those uh, arguments either. You also want to remind people there's also something to be said for just doing the right thing. And I think most people in their heart of hearts when they think about it, especially if you get them outdoors, it dawns on them, the right thing is to uh, make sure we do everything we can so that our kids and grandkids enjoy the beautiful ecosystems that we enjoy as well. So true. Well, I think we can wrap up on the question of the moment, which you've actually been addressing from a variety of angles. Um, and I'm gonna twist it a little bit. Um, how can we work with Mr. Trump to accomplish our goals? Yeah, I don't think we really know yet. So um, it's a little bit of a headache for people with jobs like mine because um, everything he does is so unpredictable. Maybe this will maybe this will have advantages. We'll see. But I'll tell you what TNC is going to do for sure. Um, and right after the election, I put out a little memo to my team because you know everybody wanted to know, Mark, what do you think? What are we going to do? And, we, and I said three things. First, we're going to do everything we can to work with the new administration. That's what we do for a living at the Nature Conservancy. We engage. We're not wimps. Um, if things are bad, we'll object, we'll speak up, but if we see opportunities to, to be champions for smart stuff, we're going to do it. If we, can, if we can frame our goals and objectives in ways that will mobilize majority coalitions, we're going to do that. And I'm cautiously optimistic we can do that. So we're going to do our best to work with this new administration. And my guess is we'll find some opportunities, we'll probably also find some big obstacles, and we'll deal with that one step of, at a time. Other organizations will be, be kind of like Greenpeace in my example. Other organizations will be more on the, um, uh, the, the campaigning side, and there's a role for that too. But we're going to do our best to engage and work. And remember, you know, this isn't a one-man, you know, it's, it's not a kingdom. Uh, there's a Congress, and there are good people on both sides of the aisle in that Congress, and we're going to work with them. And our supporters are close to them, and, and there are great people on those staff. So, we're going to do our best there. Second, we're going to stand by our science. We're not going to back down for one second from our science. So no, you know, climate change isn't some little uh, joke. Do a moment to celebrate that, mo that point. And then the third thing we said, um, and maybe this has diminished a little bit recently, but I don't think anybody's forgotten. I mean, we noticed some kind of alarming and very offensive and very concerning th said things were said during the campaign. And we're not going to back down in any way from our commitment to being an inclusive organization that respects all people and make, makes room for all people. Indeed, we think that's the path forward 
to achieving environmental progress, finding ways to bring people together. People, you know, you name it, whatever the kind of person it is, we want them on our side and we respect them. So we won't back down there too. So stay tuned. Uh, we're going to do our best. You know, in other times in American history when env the environmental movement has been challenged, that's actually led to some of our most important breakthroughs. So, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Will you join me in thanking Mark one more time for these great Thank comments? Thank you. Very inspiring. I appreciate that. Yes, um, so we're going to thank you all for joining us tonight for this important and I think very, actually very uplifting uh, conversation. Thank you, Mark. And this does close our fall lecture series for 2016. We're beginning to plan our 2017 events now, so stay tuned. We'll be giving you more about that. And if you're on our email list, we'll send updates to your inbox. You can also visit aqua.org to, uh, to join our, our list. Mark is now heading right up and around the corner to the gift store, and he'll be signing copies of the aforementioned book, Nature's Fortune, How Business and Society Thrive by Investing in Nature. And again, thank you all for joining us, and thank you again, Mark.